before I went in the Army, I was sent to, uh, it was called the Florida Industrial School for Boys at that time. And then it was changed to the Industrial School and then to the Dozier School. It was beautiful, like a college campus. Everything was manicured, it was beautiful. And I look over to the right and there's a swimming pool, there's a gymnasium, there's a football field, baseball field. This is wonderful. This is a good place here. Well, I was wrong. There was a devil hiding behind every tree. Everything was neat, the bathrooms were neat. It was like in the army, you make your bed and it better be tight and a quarter better flip on it. There was nothing else to do. You were given a sickle and you went cutting the grass. Thousands of hours cutting grass. As time went by, you learn about the White House torture chamber. Put you across the bee, it's a still spring bed with the head bowl go around this way, and you got bars running in between them. And you had to lay down on your stomach, you hold on to the rails, two rails like this, and bite into the pillow. Oh, the pillow was um, it was silk. Look straight ahead, you know, this don't be try to look at them. Do not scream, do not open your mouth, do not bite us, do not try to get up. I was swimming one day and I slipped on the diving board and I said, get. Well, that took me to the White House for the first time. I tried to step over the step going in and the guy behind me, the man, hit me in the back of the head and I fell down and bloodied my nose. And we go with four or five other boys. He said, lay on the bed, grab the railing, look over the wall, bite the pillow, and don't make any sounds or we'll start over. And that paddle was about maybe two and a half foot long, quarter inch pieces of leather with a piece of steep metal thrown in between. And when that thing hit me, I thought my head would explode. You can't sit down. I mean, it was that sore. And when we left, we went over to Mr. Haddon's office. And I said, I have to use the bathroom. Right there, go use the bathroom. I go in and I look at myself in the mirror and it was this horrible blood all over from my nose. I looked like a monster. I tried to pull my pants down, but my underwear wouldn't come off, be down because they were beaten into my buttock. And I said, one day I'm gonna come back here and I'm gonna tell about what you people are doing here and he pointed his finger at me. He said, that's a good way to wake up dead tomorrow morning, Sunday boy. I was taken from California because our mother had abandoned me and my half-sister and a baby. The school called and said that they hadn't seen us for three or four days. And when the police arrived, I was sitting inside uh, holding a dead baby, trying to feed it cornflakes because our mother had ran off with some guy and then transferred at four years old to the Children's Home Society in Jacksonville. This would be like, say at four or five years old, your parents taking you to school and never coming back. You will use the bathroom as school bathrooms are. You will eat in the cafeteria. You will do the same thing every day for years and you will never leave. They would lock us in the closet without food or water 
for days at a time. The abuse in the orphanage was quite a bit different than the abuse at the Florida School for Boys at Mariana. I had worked a day shift. I left, I think, at Valley about maybe three o'clock and went back to Cleveland Cottage. I got called into the office maybe a half hour later to go back to the hospital. I said, Mr. Delander, I work the day shift. He said, they need somebody for the night shift. Go back. I said, okay. So I showed up and I go in and the front door, they're bringing in this kid and they have him on the table. Mrs. Womack, the nurse, she says, cut his pants off. I get the scissors, start cutting his pants off. I pull his boot off and the boot is just full of blood. What had happened, I learned, was that he had ran away. If somebody escaped, they called the dog boys. If they caught this person, they were allowed to rape him, beat him, sick the dogs on him, whatever they had to do. Well, this kid's legs were just cut up bad. So I got his pants off and I said, when is Dr. Wexler coming? He said, don't you worry about that. And we waited and we waited and we waited. Well, 30 or 40 minutes later, nothing. He says, get him on the gurney and take him down, put him in the bathtub, wash him up a little bit. Put him on the gurney, down. The bathtub is real high back there. I put him in the tub. He'd never moved the whole time. And I got a little brave. I said, Miss Womack, what about that boy in the bathtub? She says, don't you worry about him. We'll take care of him. I went back on the back porch and that's where I stayed the whole night shift. Dr. Wexler never came. And the boy, I guess, was dead. Before I went to work at the hospital, I was uh, working at the dry cleaners. There was only two presses in there and you had to be really careful. If you ever left that press, you were going to the White House. We heard a big commotion, cars coming up. One of the boys came down and I walked outside. He said, they just found the boy dead in the dryer. Somebody put him in the dryer. Then they brought out this like stretcher covered with a sheet and there was this arm hanging out. Somebody had killed him, but nobody was ever charged. Of course, the story was that he had spit on one of the counselors. Certain boys were told, hit him in the head, throw him in the dryer and kill him. I, I guess if, if you've got some way of looking at my rap sheet, oh boy, I got, all kind of assault charges. I ended up going back to prison nine times, all told. I did a hell of a life, you know, before I finally woke up. I did. I, I've been through a whole lot and I carried other people through a, lot, a whole lot without the second thought. I'm still kicking. Not that high, but I'm kicking. Amen. So I thank each and every one of you. God bless you. When you are kicked out the gate, what do you do? Do you know nothing? How do you make money? You were always taken care of. How do you get clean clothes? Who does that? That was done for you. Everybody outside the orphanage now treats you like you're an idiot because you don't know anything. By the time you get out, even if you were treated okay, you have no emotions whatsoever. Nothing. The combination of everything turned raw, unruly boys into hardened, violent men. I tried to go do the right thing. I tried to get a job and do the nine to five. I couldn't have a relationship even with a girlfriend. It just, I could not love anybody. I didn't want to get close to anybody. Just could not show that affection. I had so much hatred built up into me. So I turned to a life of crime. I lived on the street for a couple of years. I decided to go 
to Albany, Georgia for some reason. I went into nursing school where I became an EMT at Pennington Ambulance Service. That was the probably the turning point in my life. I had become somebody, I had some use to humanity. No matter whether it was that way or not, I had to make it the way I thought it should be in my life. And even though I'm married now, and, and I'm happy, uh, I have uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I've never got over the feeling of always being alone. That never leaves you. This all stemmed from the start right there in that reform school. If you'd have been treated like a human instead of a piece of dung, my life would have been different. I wouldn't have got out trying to take my hatred out of society. What if? What if? There was this thing called classmates.com. Well, let me go in. I start filling the thing out and it says high school. Well, the only high school I went to was Florida School for Boys. And a friend of mine says, have you ever uh, thought about getting a website? I don't even know what that is. I got a website and I started writing about the orphanage and the reform school, putting my stories on there. Right out of the blue, my phone rang. Is this Roger Kaiser? I said, yeah. He says, Edward Asner would like to speak to you. He said, uh, I was reading some of your stories. Have you ever thought about being published? Who would ever want to read my crap, you know? Two weeks later, I was under a contract and my book came out, Orphan, A True Story of Abandonment, Abuse, and Redemption. And then it hit the news. Men started coming out of the woodwork, you know. It was a happy day when the school closed, White House shut down. We have an update now on a story 10 Tampa Bay has been following for years. State leaders are announcing new details in the case and investigation into the Dozier School for Boys in the Florida Panhandle. The longtime reform school is known for decades of abuse, including beatings, torture and rape. In 2016, investigators identified 55 human remains. A more extensive yeah, I caused it to happen. That was a good day. A lot of the men were crying and this and that. It was a good day. I don't hold anything against any of them. If Mr. Hatton or Mr. Tidwell hadn't beat me, the nurse would have beat me or the doctor would have beat me or somebody would have beat me. They were doing their job as bad as it was. I've gone before the Kiwanis Club, the JCs, many groups and organizations that helped them. And I did raise $25,000 one year. And I threw a Christmas in July party for the orphans at the Baxley Children's Home. I have fought for years to have kids who were in orphanages be allowed to stay on Friday night to go home with the family and stay there Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, and Sunday and come home so they have some idea of what a family structure is like. But they refuse to do that. As far as I'm concerned, the orphans of today are going to end up just like me. They're going to end up totally emotionless. The one thing that is positive about this 
let's say that in Idaho, for example, somebody at a reform school molests a kid, beats a kid, or kills a kid. Now the parents are gonna go on the internet and put reform school abuse. What's gonna come up? Everything I did. And when the parents call the governor, they're gonna say, stop it. We don't need to go through the shit that Florida went through, so stop it. Thank the internet for that. It saved many kids already, I'm sure. The fact that I only went to the sixth grade and that my stories are in the school textbook of 19 foreign countries, including China. That's my greatest achievement, I think. Don't cry over spilt milk, no matter what happens in your life, because it doesn't do any good. Just do the best you can. Remember, there are other people who've had it worse than you, and there are other people who have walked in your shoes, and remember what it's like to walk in their shoes. That's basically it.